the purpose of machine learning is to generate predictive models that help in making decisions in business you can it's just not like it won't build the the model should have a purpose uh, goal and it should give some what you call uh, decision or is some sort of advice to the executives or the managers to make that is the purpose of all of this machine learning so machine learning is where we have to train the machines now in ai artificial intelligence you might have heard about ai right in ai and deep learning the requirement of training is not there the machines themselves will learn the machines will themselves self correct and self adjust and accordingly they will in ai the difference between ml and ai is in ml manual training of the machine has to be done with historical data in case of artificial intelligence and deep learning you just give it data it learns on its own it learns the features on its own it self corrects self adjusts and performs based on the data given so the requirement of training is not there in ai and dl ai and dl they have the ability to self learn whereas in ml there is no self learning you have to manually train the machines and you have to perform the various steps of data pre processing even in ai data pre processing is done by the algorithm itself the ai algorithm if you give the step what what it should do with missing values it will do it will include those things also in the learning process and then it will correct the data and then it will use the models to perform so that is where the difference comes into picture in ml you have to train the machines you have to train it on historical data you have to do the data pre processing you have to constantly monitor it and you have to correct it manually when it is not performing based on the required parameters then within the machine learning we have something called supervised learning in supervised learning we have the complete understanding of the data in terms of variables and also models or algorithms in case of supervised learning we have complete understanding of the data how based on the business problem right you look at the life cycle right we and first we need to understand the business problem then we understand the data then we pre process the data then we do the eda right that means in supervised learning we will have complete understanding of the data once you have the complete understanding of the data you know which models to use you know which models will perform well accordingly you will make that process we call it as supervised learning in unsupervised learning no understanding of data as data might not be in proper structure hardware failure during collection process lead to discrepancies understanding of unsupervised learning is where we don't have any understanding of the data now it can happen because of two reasons either your data structure is not proper that means there is some problem in your database itself sql database itself like i told you sometimes the variable structures will be redefined by somebody else data was earlier in categorical now it became numeric so that sort of errors will keep up creep up when people with different database access work in different locations and they don't coordinate with each other this problem will come second reason why you see unsupervised learning data is hardware failure sensor when you are collecting data to those sensors when you are collecting data to web scrapers some problem might occur and the sensor might malfunction or your web scraping uh, code is no longer relevant the html structure of the page has changed html structure changes your scraper also needs to be changed then your data collection process will be either completely stopped or it will be getting you data which is completely out of structure with lot of errors and there we have a problem we don't have any understanding of the data sometimes when you're collecting data through sensors sensors malfunction you will get the data from one junction of tra suppose you are trying to understand traffic patterns one sensor failed in one junction tra traffic junction there are eight junctions the other seven junctions will give you data this junction will not give you the data and this junction is middle between this this is the middle junction then what will happen you cannot assess the flow right let us say sensor 6 has failed between 1 to 8 and all these eight sensors are required to understand the flow pattern now if the middle sensor fails what will happen you have a block in the data right then can you assess can you build a model to understand the traffic flow and pat pattern sometimes very rarely google maps fails when it can't read the local sensors it is not a problem google uses the local localized sensors and it collect the satellites 
uh, interact with the webcams and uh, what you call uh, traffic cams, sensors. They collect the data indirectly through that. Of course, they officially collect the data from Hyderabad police. They pay them money and all. But if those sensors don't fail, Google Maps also will fail to give you. Otherwise, if they're working, Google Maps will give you at 95% uh, accuracy the traffic pattern, the red color. If there is a traffic block, it will tell you, right? Now, if the pad, if the sensor in a particular junctions are not working, Google can't help it, right? So there will be problems. Then they have to come and sort the problem. They have to use previous data. What Google immediately will do is yesterday's data it will take for the particular time frame, inserts into it, completes the data block, and make sure the data, the algorithm performs naturally. And expect them to continue to work on the sensor and rectify the problem. So the unsupervised learning generally comes when you have this sort of data structure. Structural issues in data is what unsupervised learning is all about. Otherwise, most of the times we know the data, we understand the data. Either we have the subject matter expertise or domain expertise, we will have an understanding of the data. And if there are minor issues in data, we know how to deal with them. We know how to deal with those things. But even in unsupervised learning also, we, we have certain methodologies to deal with those type of data and come up with a solution. Because there are companies that are depend on data, data centric companies like Google, Facebook, Twitter, without data, somehow they have to manage. Even if the data is not working properly, they still have to manage. So they have to have that understanding of the data. And if some problem occurs, which is out of their control, still they have to adjust their business. They have to adjust the models and perform. Still they have to make sure they, they have to have that problem. So that is where backup backups will be taken of data. A lot of data is stored properly in historical data, because that will help you to fill up the data in the problem times and make sure your models are running. So that sort of things happen in supervised and unsupervised learning. Within supervised learning, where we have two types of methods, regression models, where your dependent variable y is closer to normal distribution and no missing classification models, where the dependent variable non-numeric and either or multinomial more than two levels of classes all right you understood the context right this is you have to remember when to use regression when to use classification it all depends on the structure of your dependent variable it all depends on the structure of your dependent variable numerical continuous regression non-numeric binary or multinomial classification now within regression models the primary model multiple linear the multiple model is uh, sorry the primary model is multiple linear regression also called as mlr multiple linear regression multiple linear regression explains the relationship explains the linear relationship sorry explains the linear relationship dependent variable numerical closer to normal distribution and multiple independent variables so multiple linear regression explains the linear relationship what is the word linear means here linear means what linear means a straight line relationship a linear relationship between a dependent variable y and multiple independent variables x is a straight line relationship y is equal to ax plus b or mx plus c straight line equation if you remember for simple linear regression, y is equal to mx plus. Here we will have multiple. We will not have one single variable. We will have multiple independent. So the object of multiple linear regression is to explain a linear relationship between a dependent variable and independent variables. The multiple linear regression is an equation. The multiple linear regression is an equation that is used. The output of multiple linear regression is an equation. The output of the algorithm is an equation. And that equation is used for prediction purposes. Now, what is the equation? Y is equal to B0 plus B1 X1 plus B2 X2 plus B3 X3, B4 X4, Bn Xn plus the error term. This is the multiple linear regression equation is equal to intercept. Let me explain the components. Y is dependent 
variable which must be closer to normal distribution minimal outliers and no missing and no missing values there will be two types of y y and y hat y is your actual data y hat is your predicted data in statistics we use y as your actual dependent variable data y hat there will be inverted v on top y hat we call it as predicted y nowadays we are using predicted y only predicted uh, the variable name predicted mpg predicted count like that you will get a predicted values now how the prediction happens using this equation using this equation the prediction will happen now b0 is intercept or also called as constant now what is an intercept what is an intercept yes what no no what is intercept the point at which straight line touches the what axis x no y axis intercept is the point at which the straight line breaches the that we call it as intercept or constant intercept or constant is the point at which the y axis will touch the sorry the line with straight line will breach the y axis or touches the y axis b1 b2 b3 b4 and till bn we call them as coefficients we call them as coefficients x1 x4 till xn we call them as independent x1 x2 x3 till xn we call them as independent also called as error term or residual residual is actual value minus predicted value residual or error term the formula is actual value minus predicted so these are the components of the equation these are the components of the coefficients are like weights coefficients are like weights or coefficients can be interpreted interpreted as uh, if one unit of change in the independent variable what is the impact on the independent variable that is represented by the coefficient i will explain interpretation of coefficients but coefficients are can be termed as weights or the impact values that affect the dependent variable right interpretation once we get the output i will explain it to you any doubts till now people yeah because this is the complete compulsory algorithm this is mandatory you have to understand because this is guaranteed questions you will get this is compulsory algorithm for any interview because this is the base baseline model we call it as baseline model the first model you always run when you get the data is the baseline model baseline model in regression is multiple linear regression baseline model in classification is binary logistic regression so you need to have 100% knowledge of these two algorithms compulsorily you will get interview questions on these algorithms without these questions a data science or data analyst interview will not okay so make sure you understand the equation make sure you are understanding the assumptions make sure you understand the interpretations that is very very important so don't worry i i will by the end of this today's session you will have a complete understanding so everything will be implemented that will enhance your understanding so how the equation is created what it what its role we will do it with a hands on example so this is the equation now if you look at the equation what data we have if you look at the equation what data we already have we have the data of y we have the data of independent variables what data we don't have coefficients and intercept in regression we already have the y values we already have the values for x x1 x2 x3 what we don't have is the intercept and the coefficient so the algorithm the algorithm uses matrix formulation to solve for the intercept plus coefficients so we need this intercept and coefficients the algorithm so what it should do it should solve for the intercept and coefficient it uses matrix the formula is b0 b1 b2 b3 till can be achieved through x transpose multiplied by x to the inverse matrix to the inverse matrix multiplied by x transpose multiplied by this is the matrix formulation which is used xt represents transpose of x matrix so xt till here is inverse of the matrix inverse of matrix y is the dependent variable and x is the independent variables 
matrix. So if you want to code the algorithm in any language, C language, Java, or anywhere, you have to code, code this formulation. If you write your own program or coding of a linear regression algorithm, you should write a program for this formula. X transpose multiplied by X to the inverse matrix multiplied by X transpose multiplied by Y. This is the regression matrix formulation or the formula of regression that we use for solving for the coefficients and the intercept. X transpose multiplied by X. So this also they are asking nowadays, what is the matrix formulation also they are asking in interviews. See, this is the formula. We will present X transpose with the single quote. X single quote into X to the inverse matrix minus one into X transpose into Y. What is? So if you want to write a code in any language, C programming, Java or Python or R, anything like that, you have to code this formula. You have to code this formula. Then you will get the coefficients and the intercepts. And then you can do the further analysis. Can you go ahead? Now, the very important thing is the assumptions. The assumptions of multiple linear regression. The assumptions of multiple linear and these assumptions are compulsory. If any one of these assumptions is not met, the algorithm will fail. If any one of these assumptions is not met, algorithm will fail. The primary is Y must be closer to normal distribution, minimum outliers, and no missing values condition. Y must be numerical, continuous, closer to normal distribution with minimum outliers and no can be both numerical and non-numerical. X can be both numerical and non. Independent variables can be both numerical as well as non-numerical. They can also be categorical, non-numerical, but Y must be numerical. There must be a logical linear relationship between the dependent variable, independent, there must be a some sort of logical linear relationship. There must be a logical relationship. It can be strong, it can be medium, or it can be weak. But there has to be a logical linear relationship between Y and X. There must be. You can't put some variables which does not have any relationship with the variable. So there must be a logical linear relationship. It can be strong, medium, or weak also. Right there, but there has to be a logical linear relationship. The next one is no multicollinearity. No multicollinearity. Multicollinearity, very strong correlation, very strong correlation, typically greater than 0 0.95, typically greater than 0 0.95 among variables. Multicollinearity. This is a very common interview question which most of the people may fail to explain is simply a very strong correlation of greater than 0 0.95. Some textbooks say, statistical textbooks say 0 0.90 above. But in my practical experience in industry, we look at greater than 0. Point, a very strong correlation between variables will lead to overfitting problem. Overfitting problem means you get a model which is too good to be true. Like I told you, now, there is no 100% in statistics and ML. Maximum you can do is 95% or 99% only. So if a model gives you 100%, that means it's a overfitting. So multicollinearity causes that overfitting problem. If multicollinearity is found, do not include both the variables. You should not include both the variables. Choose one among them. You have to choose one among them. If two variables having multicollinearity, you cannot include both the variables in your model as independent variables. You must choose only one variable among them. That you have to do based on the business problem and your logical understanding. The choice which you will delete or which variable to include is based on the business problem and your logical analysis. How do we identify multicollinearity? Correlation analysis. What is correlation analysis? Bivariate analysis. It gives correlation between two variables. So if you find greater than 0 0.95 correlation between two variables, do not include both the variables in the model. You have to drop one variable and you have to include the other variable. Now, which variable to include based on the business problem and also based on your logical understanding of the data. But you should not include both the variables. Both the multicollinear variables must not be included in the 
The next assumption is huh? correlation is done only on numerical data only. On categorical, we don't do co correlation analysis. See, correlation is done in combination of tools. Uh, you will have multiple variable combinations you can have. You can have different combination of variables having uh, different co multicollinearities. You have to drop them. According to the each two, you have to look at the pair and drop one, one, one like that you have to do. It, multiple variables can have multicollinearity with each other. Among them, you found out six variables are having multicollinearity. That means three pairs of multicollinearity. So you have to drop three variables. You have to choose three variables. Or if you only variable is having different multicollinearity, different variables, you start, delete those variables and you keep the other three variables. It can happen. It will happen. Yes, it's a matrix calculation, right? CORR. I showed you, no? You can do it with more than. You can do correlation analysis with hundreds of variables. You can plot a heat map. And we have done the SNS heat map also, right? Exogeneity. The dependent variable is dependent on independent variables, vice versa, but not y vice versa. Y is dependent on excess, but excess do not depend on this is called principle of exogeneity dependent variable is dependent on independent variables but independent variables do not depend on the dependent variable this we call it as principle of exogeneity this is also one of the assumption you need to take into consideration when you're dealing with mlr sample size sample size required is minimum 20 observations per variable the sample size required for multiple linear regression is minimum 20 observations per variable. Minimum. The, the greater, the better. But worst case scenario, minimum 20 observations per. Okay, I'm forgetting something. Linearity, homoscedacity, normality, and independence of independent variables. Yeah. Now, these are the assumptions you check before the model. These are the assumptions we check before the model building process, pre-model assumptions. There are two post-model assumptions based on residuals. Post-model assumptions based on resi residuals. So the above one are all pre-model assumptions. These are your pre-model assumptions. The assumptions which, assumptions which you need to look at before building the model. Now, the post-model are residuals must be homoskedastic, homoskedasticity of residuals. Residuals must be in a narrow range, left to right, diagonal. Residuals must be in a narrow range, diagonal, left to right, upwards. That we call it as homoskedasticity. So, homoskedasticity versus heteroskedasticity is one of the important thing in interviews also they ask you after multicollinearity. Apart from multicollinearity, they will also ask you what is homoscedasticity and what is heteroscedasticity. So if you look at these two diagrams, if you look at these two diagrams, this is your homoscedastic model, which is required in multiple linear regression. If you have a good fit model, your residuals will be looking like this. If it is not a good flower bouquet pattern, this looks like a flower bouquet pattern, right? If it is a flower bouquet pattern, we call it as heteroscedasticity, which is important in time series data. Heteroscedasticity in time series, homoscedasticity in multiple linear regression, the two patterns. Homoscedasticity means narrow range. They are all in a narrow range, right? Left to right, upwards, diagonal. If you are R square, if you have a good fit model, you will have residuals in a narrow range, left to right, diagonal upwards. So this is your homoscedastic pattern. This is your heteroscedastic pattern. Heteroscedastic will be a flower bouquet-ish pattern. Heteroscedasticity we look for in time series data. We don't use it in multi multiple linear regression. Multiple linear regression is all about homoscedasticity of residuals. Residuals must be normally distributed. To find this, QQ plot is used to find whether the normal residuals are normally distributed or not. If residuals are all or either, if residuals are all on straight line, closer to straight line, normally distributed. So, what is this Q and Q plot? Quantile, quantile plots. See, we should look like these plots. You'll get a line and you'll see the residuals like this, right? If most of the residuals are on straight line, 
And some of them are moving away from the straight line. We call them as normally distributed. Yes, yes, tell me. Yeah, but uh, I don't think I'm eligible, right? Right now I'm busy. Can you call me later? Right now I'm busy. Let me call you. Now, look at this. this is the representation of the quantile plots. If it is normally distributed, you will see most of the residuals are on the if you see the, this like this, moving away from the top of the line, it is positive skewness. If it is negative skewness, you will see the residuals going downwards towards the... So, if your QQ plot will tell you where the problem lies. If the residuals are topwards, then you can assume there is a positive skewness problem in your dependent variable. And also, you might have the same problem with your independent variables. Scaling of independent variables, logarithmic transformation of dependent variable could help you resolve this problem. Negative skewness, you can see here. So, the QQ plots, these are the QQ plots, the line with the residuals, right? You get it, right? So, you can see if it is normally distributed, most of them will be on the, if they are not normally distributed, you will have these two patterns. I will also do the homoscedasticity, heteroscedasticity graph also for you to understand what it is. Because again, uh, you will have a problem in explaining to the recruiters what is what. Homoscedasticity and heteroscedasticity and the QQ plots, okay? So, these are post-model residuals. These two assumptions are post-model on residuals. Assumptions are very important. You will never get in straight lines. See, residuals, there will be always a spread, right? How can they be straight line? They will be always spread. So, you cannot have them on straight line. Residuals will always be spread. They will be spreading. They cannot be on one line. That's why I use the narrow range, not minimum range, narrow range. They should be in a narrow range. Narrow means a restricted range. Numeric you know, scaling is done only on numeric. Non-numeric, you have to label encode, right? Scaling is done only on numeric data, not on label encoded or dummy encoded data. Huh, but there are categories. How can you treat them as numbers? Label encoding is just giving a numerical identifier to the data. It is just dummy variable encoding. You cannot treat them as numbers. You have to treat them as non-numeric categories only. You will not get the regression output correctly. Your regression model will definitely fail. The statistical interpretation of the statistical interpretation of multiple linear regression output. The statistical interpretation of multiple linear regression output. Adjusted R square must be in range of 0 0.60 to 0. Adjusted R square must be in the range of 0 0.60 to 0. Point. Adjusted R square, the amount of variance occurring in the dependent variable caused by or independent adjusted R square. When you do regression, you will get different types of R square. You will get R square, you will get multiple R square, and you also get adjusted R square. We will consider adjusted R square. Why? Because adjusted R square is sensitive to independent, it reduces if independent variable is insignificant and increases independent variable is adjusted R square is the first metric you should look for. And it must be in the range of 0 0.60 to 0 0.95. Less than 0 0.60, underfitting. Greater than 0 0.950, overfitting. Less than 0 0.60, underfitting, greater than 0 0.90, uh, 95, overfitting. Adjusted R square explains the amount of variance caused in the dependent variable explained by the model or the set of independent. Why we use adjusted R square? Because it is sensitive to variable significance. Independent variable significance affects the adjusted R square. If variables are significant, the adjusted R square will go up. If the independent variables are not significant, the adjusted R square will go down. That is the first thing you should check. Model P value, you will find it uh, just below adjusted R square or also called as significance in MS Excel. The model P value, which you will find just below the adjusted R square or significance set. In Excel, it is called as significance set must be 0.0. 0 0.05. The model P value or the significance of F must be less than 0 0.05. Now, whenever there is a P value, like I told you earlier, there is always a null and alternate hypothesis. The null hypothesis here is 
coefficients are equal to zero. Alternate hypothesis is coefficients are not equal to what are the coefficients? The b's, b1, b2, b3 in the equation, right? If any of them is zero, you multiply anything with zero, what will it become? Will zero have an effect? So we must reject the null hypothesis here. That means we whatever coefficients we are getting must be not equal to zero. If any coefficients are equal to zero, the algorithm will automatically eliminate them. You will not get them in the output. It automatically eliminates them. The independent variable p value must be less than 0 0.05. For every independent variable also a p value will be generated. So what is the null hypothesis? The independent variable is insignificant. Insignificant means what? No effect. Alternate hypothesis is the independent variable or has a effect. Independent variable is insignificant or independent variable is significant. We have to reject the null hypothesis here also. Now, some variables might be significant, some variables might be insignificant. So what we will do? You remove all the insignificant variables and you build the model only with significant variables. That process you have to do. But the sequence of interpretation is must. Only first condition is met, you go to the second condition. That means adjusted R square is in the range, go to the second condition. Adjusted R square in the range, model p value is also less than 0 0.05, go to the third condition. But if first two condition, uh, conditions are not met, your model has failed. If the first two conditions are not met, your model has failed, you have to completely look at your data and rebuild your new model with new set of variables. So these are the statistical interpretations. Now, in Python, we only get R square. So in Python, we just get R square. And we only get intercept plus coefficient. That's all. No p-values in Python SKLM. We will just get in R square and we only get intercept and coefficient. Because Python interpretation is purely based on machine learning. The statistical software is different. R is statistical software. But Python is not a statistical software. Python is a machine learning software. So in machine learning, we don't look at p-values. So when you look at the regression output in Python, you'll get R square, not even adjusted R square. You will get plain R square. And we will get intercept and coefficient for building the equation. And the diagnostics for all regression models, the diagnostics for all regression models is root mean, also called as RMSE. There is no fixed range and it is a comparative metric and model that has the least RMSE. Root mean square error. The formula is RMSE SQRT mean of residual square root of mean of residual. And what is residual? Actual value minus predicted square root of mean of residual square. This is the diagnostic for all regression models. Predicted minus actual or actual minus predicted whole square divided by n. Yeah, this is all you have to remember. RMSE you have to remember. RMSE you have to remember. You have to remember the equation of regression that has to be remembered. Because you have to explain to the recruiters. Because without these things, you cannot work on any model. So RMSE is very important. The clarity must be there. That you will get in R. You have to use R. If the client wants P values, you have to use a statistical software. It can be R, it can be SPSS, or it can be any statistical software which is available to you at that point of time. But you will not get P values in Python, SKLearn, machine learning. That is side by that starts. That's a different model. model. SKLearn is a different model. There's an exclusive library called SKLearn. That is a core library of Python for machine learning. They are completely independent libraries. No connection between those two libraries. SKLearn is the one with purely machine learning library in Python. Those residual charts we don't get in Python. We will get them in the only in statistical uh, models where like R or when we're discussing R, that time you'll get it. If you want to do that in Python, you can plot them using the C bond. SNS library is there where we can use that to plot that, but you won't get them as part of output. Remember SKLearn Python, which is the core library for machine learning, does not give you any p-values anywhere for any model whatsoever. The whole community says in machine learning and productions, because we can't stick to the 
p values if you stick to the p values you cannot build a proper model at all so python very very different out uh, you'll get in python also you'll get only r square not even adjusted r square pure r square so if you look at the scikit learn regression ordinary least squares oh i forgot ordinary least square i'll just explain what is the ordinary least square attributes coefficients so what you get as an output predict score see fit will refer refer r square it will give you only not even the adjusted r square pure r square so one other thing you need to understand is multiple linear regression is also called as ordinary least square ordinary least square or also called as ols as it fits a straight line residuals in such a manner the distance residual and straight line ols method or ordinary least square error method ols method is where a straight line is fitted among the residuals in such a manner that distance between the residual and the straight line is minimal if you have residuals you can draw a line like this you can draw a line like this you can draw a line like this you can draw different lines straight lines but the best fit line is the line that has the minimum distance between the residuals and the straight line so ordinary least square method see this is the ordinary least square method minimize the sigma y minus y hat whole square so the other name of mlr is ols ordinary least square regression minimize the error or you need to have a best fit model that has the lowest error simplistic terms i want a model that has the least error you cannot make error zero that also you can do you have to remember errors cannot be made zero we can only minimize them to an acceptable level that is the rms only y minus y hat whole square mean and square root the algorithm will fit the line based on it will do in the back end multiple iterations and identifies the best fit line and gives you the best fit coefficient that is the methodology used by regression to get the line see what is regression a line has to be fitted how it fits based on the error minimal error it will draw multiple lines calculates the error and draw gives you the best line that has the least error and also call calculates the coefficients for that best line this is all the back end process where there is another method called maximum likelihood method we use it in generalized linear modeling uh, we will discuss it at a later stage nowadays uh, some companies are using glm models generalized linear models because generalized linear model linear models have a slightly better performance than the ols model there in generalized linear models you will not get r square you will get aic akaikas information criteria so there are different set of models are also being there which are used in industry by some one of the student in the pk23 batch she is already working she her organization are using glm models not the basic multiple linear regression model so it depends on industry to industry she is working with a bank client where i think it is a risk model so they are using glm model so glm uses maximum likelihood estimate there is another method called mle like ols we have an mle method so that method is used this is an advanced method maximum likelihood estimate method is an advanced method statisticians researchers in uh, mostly american and european universities and regression and these are very old methods they are not new methods na regression has been there for more than 100 years so it's not something new so this slide should be there is a slide general linear models estimation algorithms hemicalis goal of the thesis mixed life regression words the general linear model The general linear model is a statistical linear model that can be written. Y is a matrix with series of multivariate only one column in the difference of the difference of phi. This I matrix constitute mel approach levels of positive definite linear models by line for most exactment on and x as multiple no that column so you can see the uh, estimation here for ols we use this x transpose x to the inverse y right for uh, glm model we use this one y predict is equal to i n minus x into x transpose and n n is a identity matrix it uses a different slightly different formula and mle uses either newton raphson or fisher scoring estimation methods so these are a little bit advanced but this is our basic what you call ols model 
x transpose x to the inverse matrix. So extension of that is your uh, MLE method, which uses additional parameters like uh, uh, Newton Raphson or Fisher scoring method to get the generate the MLE estimation. So it depends on industry to industry, some industry, but OLS is the basic model. OLS is the basic model, which you, uh, which you need to remember. MLE is uh, an additional model, which are now being adapted in industry based on requirement. So maximum likelihood is slightly complicated calculation compared to OLS. Basic assumptions are same for both the methods. Basic assumptions are same for both the methods. I think in SQL1 also we have generalized linear model. Yeah, generalized linear regression is also there. See GLM regression, GL generalized linear regression. So you can see here in generalized linear regression, H into XW, the minimization formula is also different with our regularization. And in generalized linear regressions, you can do other regressions also. Poison, gamma, and inverse Gaussian. Normal is your uh, regression, normal multiple linear regression. There are distributions. See, Poison distribution is this. Now, Poison distribution is where we model rare events. Poison distribution is where we model, which one? No, probability distributions are different. Huh. It can be in probability also, because uh, when you are assessing the probability of rare events, yeah, it can be used in probability also. Huh? Which one? Ah, that's what natural uh, calamities and all poison distribution is used number of deaths mortality rate in policies when you're clear, calculating premiums for the group you have to have the mortality rate right what is the probability of how many percent of the group may die that is a poison distribution so when the actuarial actuarial guy will build the model uh, licensing scheme sorry insurance scheme he will should have a people or group of people the probability of death for the person should be minimal. So they build a corpus of fund where they want the people dying should be minimal. So death rate or the mortality rate follows poison distribution and it is used there also. So where you need to predict how many people die. So you should have less than 10% people dying. Otherwise, if more than that dies, your claim amount will be higher and your whole corpus will go to that claim amount. Nothing will be left for the company. So the company wants less amount of people to die so that they can retain all the premiums amount as profits. Yeah, so when COVID and all, see, uh, that's where insurance companies come into problem. Insurance companies are affected by natural calamities where there is mass and company the governments will take a decision to pay the insurance even though they are not covered. Even though they are not covered by the insurance policy, the governments will force the insurance companies to pay the premiums. So mass calamities, if in a year there are a lot of natural disasters happening, then the insurance companies will be in loss because they have to pay claims, whether it is property claims, life claims or vehicle claims or whatever it is. What is the primary business of Warren Buffett? Insurance, reinsurance. Why do you think Warren Buffett is such big money? He is the reinsurer for insurance companies. He insures, insures the insurance companies. And if American company, if there are no, what you call uh, tornadoes, if the number of tornadoes are less and uh, the destruction is less, insurance companies will have huge profits in US. If the tornadoes are very bad, like last year and this year, cities, cities, uh, sorry, towns and cities were destroyed. Companies have to pay claims. Then they are in deep trouble. That's why the insurance companies in US are now in financial trouble. Because last year, there were many tornadoes in US that caused very wide destruction. This year also, there are huge amount of tornadoes that caused destruction. Fire, wildfires in California were very huge. This year also, wildfires are huge. So all the general insurance companies are all in deep trouble in US, which happens every 10 years or like that. But eight years, they'll make profit. Huge profits they'll make. Because you won't have this uh, severe tornadoes, uh, tornadoes happening every year. It's a once in a 10 year affair or once in 15 years, then they will have problem. But rest of the 14 years, they make huge profits. So that is what happens. Poison distribution is more towards the rare event uh, prob probability prediction. Uh, gamma is a more of a academic uh, thing. It is used in uh, geographical studies, geological studies and all. They use gamma thing. But business, poison and normal. So open day.excel sheet and then Copy these variables, working day, weather situation, temp, a temp, humidity, wind speed, ca casual, registered, and CNT. Now, in multiple linear regression, what I told you first, you need to do multi-collinearity check. We also need to do check on the CNT, whether there are outliers and all are there. 
Here, why is numerical continuous? We already did those graphs and all in our Python analysis and all. We have studied there. We have not done multicollinearity. Now, I will show you how to do multicollinearity analysis in Excel, which is nothing but simple correlation analysis. Yeah. Now, this pattern, no? is it this is numeric continuous means you will have a sequence of numbers. You will have a numbers which will be like a flow of numbers, not a discrete values. Discrete values means 0, 1, like that. No, you have a a flow of numbers, a sequential continuous flow of numbers, not sequential, flow of numbers will be there. Zero, one. zero like here. You need to doubt this data, whether it, it, it might not be numerically and continuous. How will you know when you do min and max, descriptive study? Min is zero, max is one, that means there are only two categories. Then you have to do value counts. You can't treat them as numerical data. You have to treat them as Categorical. So in the data. No, it's all done in Python. No mix max software. Mix, no mix max in here. Only you will use only one software. Why I'm using Excel is to show you the calculations and all. Uh, if I do those calculations, you'll get confused. So to understand the concept, we use Excel as the manual calculation. We have to understand whatever we have studied before the session. Implement them in Python is just CORR. Dot CORR, you'll get the correlation matrix and you have to just check multicollinearity dot fit x y and you will get the output it will not help you what you are doing there so you need to understand what is actually happening manual calculation mm -hmm. understanding of the algorithm will be done in excel now first step is go to data tab data analysis you have correlation if you scroll up you have correlation select from temp do not select working day and weather control shift down arrow control shift side arrow do not select working day and weather situation labels in first row let it be new worksheet flight Select the data range from temp to CNT, labels in first row, new worksheet, you will get the correlation matrix. Data tab, data analysis, correlation, select all the variables from temp to CNT. Select all variables from temp to CNT. For you, it is uh, MAC, it is uh, tools, add-ins. All right, all of you got the uh, matrix, correlation matrix, you will get it in new page. Now, do you see multicollinearity? These are the correlation values. Do you see multicollinearity? Got it or not? Got it? So what do you see here? Any multicollinearity? Yeah, you got it or not? I didn't take mark labels in first row. So selected labels and you didn't take mark. Take mark labels in first row, click okay. You will get it. Why don't you take mark labels in first row? When I was selecting headers, you have to take mark labels in first row. Always select headers and always take mark labels in first row. Otherwise, you will not know what variable is what. We must know. Otherwise, we can't analyze, right? Now, do you see multicollinearity matrix? Which variables are multicollinearity? Temp and A temp has multicollinearity. If you want, you can do conditional formatting. Select the numeric values, conditional formatting, color scales, red, yellow, green. Select the numbers only, conditional formatting, color scales, red, yellow, green. All the reds will be your multicollinearities. So we have multicollinearity with two variables, temp and datum, CNT and registered. Two variables have multicollinearity, temp and datum, see here, multicollinearity and registered and CNT. You have two, two sets of variables having multicollinearity. So for doing the color scaling, select the numbers, home tab, conditional formatting, color scales, I use red, yellow, green. For doing Color scaling, select the numbers, don't select the headers. Go to home tab, conditional formatting, color scales, red, yellow, green. Because red is, we don't want multicollinearity. So that's why I'm giving red, yellow, green. Green, yellow, red, if you want higher values to be good. Here, higher values are bad. So I'm giving it as red, yellow, green. Now you can see multicollinearity between temp and a temp, CNT and register. So you have to choose. You want either temp or a temp or average temperature or adjusted temperature. You can choose any one of them. But can you drop CNT and register? Between register and CNT, what will you choose? You have to choose CNT because that is a dependent variable. You can't drop it, right? So that is the logical thinking you should have. Between register and CNT, I can't drop CNT because that is our dependent variable. So we must return it. So we will drop. In temp and a temp, we can choose anything. Your choice, you can choose temp or item because that is independent variable. So that is the logical thinking you need to have when you're looking at the multicollinearity. In real-time data, you will see multicollinearity between variables. All of you got this matrix? Who didn't get it? This one, same thing. Greater than 0 0.95. What is multicollinearity? Greater than 0 0.95. So you have two variables, four variables having multicollinearity. Two only and two delete you have to do. Between temp and item, I will choose any one of them. That's not a problem. But when it is registered and count, 
We can't drop clones because that is our dependent derivative. So we have to drop. That is different here. That is R square. This is correlation. Don't get confused between concepts. This is correlation. Correlation also I gave you matrix. Greater than 0 0.70, strong correlation. Greater than 0 0.90, very strong correlation. Greater than 0 0.50, moderate correlation. Greater than 0 0.30, weak correlation. Less than 0 0.30 and 0, no correlation. So there is a table matrix. If you look at your team assessment, you'll understand. Which one is the one? D one. Oh, where, where this one is one? Diagonal ones will be there in correlation. The correlation between itself. So look at the horizontal and y axis. See, look at the variable. You have not done it right. That's why you are getting confused. See, this is humidity. That is also humidity. Correlation between itself is the diagonal ones are representation of the variable's correlation with its own cell. That's why you don't consider the diagonals. We have to consider non-diagonal values only. Diagonals are the correlation with itself, with the variable itself, the y and the x. So no, don't look at the diagonal ones. You have to look within the below the diagonal ones. Correlation is always two variables. It is called a bivariate statistics. Why we do only two? Combination of two, it will give you. It is giving you here combination of two, 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 it will give you. Co correlation of covariance are bivariate. Combination of two, two variables it is giving as a matrix form also. So, why are you So, identify multi-polymer. When yeah. you are having large number of variables, you have to do time scale. You can randomly time check. Suppose you have 40 variables. What will you do? So, then you should select red. So, they are on uh, very strong correlation. Uh, why did you say registered shouldn't be there? Count is independent. The count is dependent variable. How can you drop it? All right. Clear? All of you? That is your choice. After model building only, you will come to know. Not before that. After model only, you will come to know. First, build the model with only 10. Then, build the model with only 8. Times. You will find a difference in model performance, significant difference. Then, you might consider which are the highest that will take. If nothing changes, you can take any one of them. Right now, I can't say. But subject knowledge and logical knowledge says let's keep temperature which better than adjusted temperature. See, adjusted temperature means there might be some collection problems. They adjusted it to the nearest value. So instead of that, let us take the actual data of temp. Right. So data description you did with your choice. And if you still want to build two models with temp and without a uh, with a temp, you will look at the performance and decide. Building model is nothing here, just seconds of output you get. That's not the challenge. Got it, all of you? So now what we will drop is I will drop ATEM and I will drop registered. I will drop ATEM, I'll drop the delete the columns, ATEM, and I'll delete the columns registered. And they make sure there are no empty spaces in between. Save the data, data tab, registered and ATEM. You will see regression. Regression, Y range. Y is what? Dependent variable. Input Y range is dependent variable. CNT, control shift down arrow. Input Y range is the dependent variable, control shift down arrow. Input X range, simultaneously select temp till called casual, control shift down arrow. All the variables as X range. Y is only one column, which is CNT column. X is multiple columns. Tick mark labels, because we have selected the headers. Tick mark confidence level as 95%. Tick mark residuals. Yes, you can do residual plots, line fit plots, you want. Constant zero means without intercept model. But we want model without with intercept. No? Without intercept is an academic model that we never use in business. We want an intercept. And click OK, new worksheet, because the output will be large. Standardized residual means normal, normal distribution. So you will calculate the, you will use the Gaussian formula. You remember density formula. When I talked about it, 1 by e pi square, there's a very big formula. That formula is used on residuals. That we call it a standardized residual. Those plots are not needed. Got it, output, all of you got the output? Got the output, guys? Anybody didn't get the output? All right, all of you got the output. Now, what is the first thing you need to check? Excel provides you the statistical output. So you can see multiple R, R square and adjust R square. So you can see, right, adjust R square, is it meeting our criteria? It is not in the range. What was the range? 0 0.602, 0. Point. The model is outputting, uh, underfitting, because we have outliers in the CNT, right? You remember when we did the CNT variable uh, box plot in the Python, we got outliers. That is the problem why it is missing out with the base. So what is the interpretation here? Basically, the interpretation here is 57.882% variance in dependent variable is explained 
only 57.2 percent variance is explained rest of the 43 percent is unexplained by this model basically we will stop it here we will not go further because the model has failed in the adjusted r square only but since we are studying the regression we will continue with the other output interpretation also so the second thing you need to look at is this model p value or significance of f in other statistical softwares it is called as model p value in excel we call it as significance of f so this must be 0 0.05 so it is less than 0 0.05 see e minus so what is the null hypothesis here coefficients are equal to zero what is the alternate hypothesis coefficients are not equal to now what are the coefficients you can see here these are the coefficients are any one of these coefficients equal to zero you can see the coefficients on the left side none of the coefficients are equal to zero so we are rejecting the null the third the independent variables p values you can see here the independent variables p values the p values of independent variables independent p value 0 0.05 independent variable is insignificant the independent variable is significant so all the four independent p variables are less than 0. Point. so we have to reject regression equation i i will tell you now now once you've done the regression you will get the output which is not nothing but an equation the output of regression analysis is an equation how that equation is created c and t is equal to double three double eight point eight two plus four one eight zero point nine zero minus two zero seven eight point six seven into humidity or hum minus three four seven nine point eight six into wind speed plus one point one nine this is the regression equation which is created this is the whole purpose of the we need to identify the intercept plus coefficients using that intercept plus coefficients we create a regression equation this is the regression equation which is created by the model based on the intercept and coefficients this is the predictive equation predicted cnt this is called predicted cnt predicted cnt is equal to intercept plus coefficient of temp mi minus coefficient of humidity plus or oh, sorry minus coefficient of wind speed plus coefficient of casual i have created based on the coefficients based on these coefficients we have created the equation confidence levels band of values but for some models see for some models it will change this model it is it's a failed model so it is not changing if it is not a failed model it will change it's a formula calculations there are a lot of formula calculations we have to do the calculations then only you'll understand i have not got into the formula set there are multiple formulas close to 28 formulas are involved in calculating regressions so this is the predictive equation which is created based on the model so i'll go to the data sheet i will copy the first set of observations including the header i will paste them here so these are the first row of observations this is the first row of observations based on these observations predicted cnt will be calculated using this equation using this equation and the actual values equation means coefficients so how it will calculate is equal to coefficient of temp multiplied by the actual value of temp plus coefficient of humidity multiplied by actual value of humidity plus coefficient of wind speed multiplied by actual value of wind speed plus coefficient of casual multiplied by the actual value of casual coefficients and the actual values 29494603 is the predicted value and you can see here you also got a predicted cnt here these two are same there is a column called predicted cnt here so as part of regression process using this equation which is created from the model for every observation in the data a predicted value is calculated a predicted value is calculated how the predicted value is calculated using the actual values and the using the actual values and coefficients for every row of data a predicted value is created calculated intercept and coefficient you can see here predicted cnt there is a column of values each column of values will be calculated in this manner so you can see here a predicted cnt is calculated for every observation what is the actual cnt what is the actual cnt as per our data what is the predicted cnt 
2989. What is the difference between actual and the predicted? Is equal to 985 minus predicted CNT. You get minus 204. This is your what we call it as. You see this residual, right? This is called residual. What is residual? Actual CNT, C and T. So as per the data, the CNT was 985. But the equation predicted it as 2989.4603. The difference between these two is, you can see there, right? Predicted CNT is also calculated. Residual is also. First copy the first row of data with headers. First copy the first row of data. And then use the formulas. Is equal to coefficient plus. Use all pluses because there are negative values. Right. So otherwise minus into minus will become plus. So uh, use plus values and then multiply with the actual values. Coefficient into actual value. Coefficient into actual value. Coefficient into actual value. Intercept common for all. What is actual? What does act, residual actually define is error. Error in prediction. Residual is, uh, what does residual tell you? Error in prediction. How much our prediction is wrong? Residual is nothing but how much our prediction is wrong. Our prediction is wrong by 2004.46. How much our prediction is wrong? It can be positive. It can also be negative. No, not, not that it is always less. It will be greater than also. It can be both positive and negative. Once you have done the prediction, what the model will be, what we have to find out whether it is a good fit model is, we need to calculate. For calculating RMSC, first we need to square the residuals. For finding RMSC, we first need to square the residuals. That means is equal to residual to the power of 2. We need to square the residuals. Just residual to the power of 2 to calculate RMSC. So residuals have to be squared. Residuals have to be squared, which is, is equal to residual to the power of 2. Now, RMSC root mean square error is equal to square root of residual square. Co copy the whole column of residual square, close bracket, two brackets, and enter. Copy the complete column of residual square is equal to SQRT average of the complete column of residual square. You get the RMSC. Yes, the more positive, the more error. Once you square the residual, the sign does not matter. Once the risk Square the residual, the sign does not matter. That is why we will scale it. Otherwise, you'll have positive and negative residuals. It will strike off to zero. There's a chance that your residual will become zero. Then you do mean and square root of zero, it will be zero. So that is a problem. It can be actual minus, it is actually actual minus predicted, but here it is saying whatever it is. Once you square, it becomes the same value, right? This is the formula. No, we have to build another model. But uh, even if you build another model, because of the outliers in the dependent variable, regression doesn't fit. Why? What is the problem here? What is the assumption that minimal outlier should be there? We are not able to solve the outliers problem. If you remember np.log also we tried. So what the option we have is linear regression does not fit this data. So we have to go to the next set of models, tree-based models and advanced algorithm. Sometimes baseline model cannot be worked out because outliers problem will be there. You can't do whatever it is. If you try to uh, logarithmic transformation also, you can't do. Nothing is happening. You can do with np.log also regression. Still, you will see underfitting model only. So once you have this all these issues, regression model should be avoided. And we go to the next model, which is a decision tree model, which is not affected by residuals. Oh, sorry, outliers. Outliers do not affect the tree-based models. They are resistant to those models. So we use tree-based models. They will definitely, R square will be greater than 0.60. In fact, R square will be above closer to 0.80. We will run those. Those model by model will go. For that model also, you'll get R square. 1253.734. Right now, you can't decide. Right now, you can't decide or which model is perfect for data because we have not gone through the models. This question you should ask me in the month of January. When we have gone through all the, okay, so keep this question till end of January, uh, till first week of January, because we are just not even completed the first model, right? We are still understanding the first model. So which model, which data we will come to know once we study all the models that will be either January middle or January first week. Then you can yourself decide which model works on which data. I can answer, but it will not help you to understand. One, two, seven, three, something. Uh, uh, five, three, sorry. 1253.714 or something. Yeah, here. Yeah. 1253.7341. 
it will not show. RMSC, you have to manually calculate. Because it is not, it's a comparative metric. Na? On its own, it is of no use. You have to build another model. Then you compare this RMSC with that model. Why, why would it show it now? Because there is no point in showing it. Independently, it does not have any value. So you have to build another model with another set of variables. Then you compare the RMSC. On its own, it does not give you any value addition. What is 1253 means? No, nothing to be done. You build another model, calculate RMSC for that model, then you compare that RMSC and this RMSC. Then you will get an understanding. Independently, RMSC is of no use. It's a comparative metric. That's what I'm telling you. Yeah. Or build a decision tree model. Compare the decision tree RMSC with regression RMSC. Then you will know. On its own, it is of no use. Then it will not give. Why, if it is of no use, why it should be given as part of output? It is our prerogative to calculate, to decide which model. Algorithm will not decide it for you. Hmm. Within regression, decision tree is one model. Regression has a lot of models. Decision tree, random forest, gradient boostings, uh, neural networks, KNN, support vector, neural, uh, what you call, uh, lasso, ridge. So there are a lot of regression models available. Not only this, this is a baseline model or the primary model we always look to build. All right, all of you got this? If you go to your Python notebook, now, why the model failed is, uh, CNT does not have outliers. Oh, CNT does not have outliers, but still we failed, okay. But it has two peaks. So see, the problem is this. CNT is not normally distributed. It is a trimodal peak. There are three peaks, one, two, three, right? Three peaks are there. Because of this only, we are not able to fit the, we are not able to fit the model because of this problem. Because it is not closer to normal, distribution that's why our model has you should not have see it has to be a normalized curve yeah bell curve as much as possible closer to bell curve now there are here outliers are not there here the data structure is a problem here there are no outliers see yeah if uh, the box plot of cnt clearly shows there are no outliers you want to try try it np.log but the data structure is not normally distributed is continuous only otherwise how will you get a box plot if it is not continuous how is box plot created? If the data is not numeric and continuous, you cannot create a histogram, you cannot create a box plot, you cannot create a density curve. These plots can be created only numeric continuous data only. If it is discrete data, you cannot calculate, the, create these plots. It's as simple as that. They will be done only on numerical continuous data only. So when you say data is categorical in nature, zero ones, all those things, you can't do with a box plot, histogram and all. What will happen if you have 0, 1 and do the histogram? You have tried on HR analytics, right? What Did you get a plot? You can't do it on categorical data, right? 0, 1s, 1, 2, 3s, you cannot do histogram, you cannot do box plot, you cannot do, because he has already tried that, right? You cannot do them. It can be done only on numeric continuous data only. Now, in this data, we have not done the label encoding, right? Bicycle data. Bicycle data, oh, I need run all the cells. Cell run all. See here, bicycle data, bicycle data dot columns. Object calls, bicycle data, double square bracket, season, year, month, holiday, weekday, working day, till weather situation. They are all object columns. Numeric calls is equal to bicycle data, double square bracket, temp to CNT. Temp to CNT, they are all your numeric calls. The first to call an instant is serial number. Day to day, we are deleting because we have already extracted season, year, month, holiday. Weekday, we have extracted from date. So we are deleting the date and instant. We don't want them. We don't want them because we have already extracted the information from the uh, date. So we don't want the date. Instant is serial number. Now, what we should do? We have how many observations? 700 odd, right? 732, 31. Month will be 12. So 12 plus 3, 15 plus 4, 19, 20, 21, weekday is 7, 28 plus 5, 32 variables or 33 variables will come. 33 variables means 660. Okay, we can do object calls is equal to object calls dummy. Object calls underscore dummy is equal to pd dot get underscore dummies object calls comma columns is equal to, you can copy from this square bracket to this square bracket and paste it here. So we have used get dummies. So how many columns? 
object calls dot shape sorry object calls dot shape object calls underscore dummy dot shape so originally seven now it created 32 columns one one category one one column and zero one yes or no binary encoding so dummies created 32 columns 32 into 20 32 plus 33 34 35 36 36 into 20 720 very close we have 720 observations right so we are sample size is enough 20 observations per variable right columns so season one season two season three season four 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, it will use, right? It will create four columns of season. Month, it will create 12, 12 columns. Month 1, month 2, month 3, and then 0, 1, 0, 1, yes or no, binary encoding, it get dummies will use. Numeric calls dot COR. Numeric calls dot COR. What we see? Multicollinearity, right? Here you have multicollinearity. Rounded off to 95, you got multicollinearity. Temp and A10. Oh, sorry, temp and registered. Numeric calls is equal to numeric calls dot drop square bracket comma single quote registered comma axis is equal to one. Why we are dropping based on multicollinearity? Based on multicollinearity, we are dropping these two variables. So what we did was we split into object calls and numeric calls. Then we have dummy encoded the object calls. Then we have Found multi we checked for multicollinearity in numeric calls. We found out two columns or uh, four variables have multicollinearity. So out of two, four we have selected two, dropped two, right? And then we have got the final data frames. Now bicycle data underscore df is equal to pd dot concat numeric calls, comma, object calls underscore dummy comma axis is equal to one column concatenation first numeric calls next to it the object calls dummy will be now we will split our data y is equal to bicycle data df dot cnt x is equal to bicycle data df dot drop cnt comma axis is equal to one multicollinearity greater than 0 0.95 greater than equal to 0 0.95 Round it up, it will become 0 0.95. It will be 0 0.95. In Excel, it showed you now what else will be correct than Excel. It showed it as dark red. It's as simple as that. Why do we need to use the brain? Let Excel do it for you. It is giving you red color. That's all. Keep your brain, brain for analysis and other things. Let the whatever convenient, let the system work out for you. Because there are a lot of complex things which you have to take a decision, right? From sklearn dot linear underscore model, we import linear reg is equal to linear regression reg model is equal to reg dot fit x comma y reg model dot score x comma y we got an r square of 0 0.9096 one second let me complete this see by including all the variables earlier we did only on four numeric variables right that's why we didn't get the proper model now you see we have once you include all the categorical variables and all those things, you got a model that fits. Okay, reg model dot score. Now if you look at the reg model, the output includes, see, the output includes coefficients and intercept. And there is no p values here. See, there is nothing called p values here. In the outputs, there is no nothing called p values in the regression model output. But you have the intercept. What is the intercept? Two two one eight point this x dot columns comma reg model dot coefficients. We'll get the coefficients of each of the variables. We'll get the coefficients for each of the. We'll get the coefficients for each of the model building is nothing, just nanoseconds. Bringing your data to shape of y and x is the biggest challenge. Once you have data in y and x, you can build any model. It's just call the function, give a short name to the function, fit the function with x comma y. Then you score the function x comma y, x comma y. So r square. Then you get the intercept and the. Now there is a predict function which will automatically create. There is a predict function available. Reg predict is equal to reg model dot predict. Like how we use the equation in Excel, right? The equation will be created by the prediction function in the back end, and it uses that equation to pre calculate predicted value for every observation in your data. 
So red credit is these values. For first observation, 816. Second observation, 312. These are the predicted CNTs which are calculated by the equation. Using the equation, the predict function will create predicted values. It is not automatically done in Python. You have to manually do it. It is not automatically done in Python. Whereas in statistical softwares like R and Excel, it is automatically done. In Python, it is not automatically done. You have to use predict function to do the equation based prediction. Now you got the predicted CNTs. Now using this predicted CNTs, we calculate like recid, which is y minus residual. This is your residual calculation, actual minus predicted. Y is your actual CNT, rec predicted is your predicted, then np dot sqrt, np dot mean reg recid. So you have an RMSE of 582. See how drastically the RMSE decreased for a fitted model. This is called fitted model because all our parameters have fitted. Now we got an RMSE of 582.014. This is the complete process of regression in Python. Only thing is you will not get p-values anywhere here. It is straight away R squared, intercept and the coefficients, create an equation, predict it, and RMSE. You have to manually calculate everything. Because Python is a uh, production-based software. If you put all statistical things, you need a lot, lot of computing power, you need a lot of storage and memory and all these created problems. So to avoid all these things, Google, Facebook and other guys have decided we will use only some basic parameters of statistics in production level machine learning. We don't want to use all those statistical things because if you, if you stick to statistical rules, you cannot build a model because it will create problems. See, we can st but statistics says you should not build because CNT is not normally distributed. If you stop there, what is the point? But we need a model, right? So you have to build a model. So you tell him, ignore the non-normality of CNT, continue with the regression. I got an adjusted R square in the range. I got the predicted values. I got an RMSO 582. That's all. And then you compare it with a model like decision tree. If decision tree gives you better RMSC, you tell him decision tree is the best fit model. If any other model gives best entry, you say that is the best fit model. You have to this, do this model comparison and you have to tell the client, I did this, this models. This was the RMSE, R squares. You compare everything and then you come up with the final solution of the model. Okay. So this is the complete process of, in Python, nothing, right? Dot fit, dot score, dot predict. That's all. You will not understand anything, but you need to understand the concept. You need to answer the questions like what is multicollinearity? What is normality? What is a residual? These are the common questions. Multicollinearity, normality, residuals. Then what are the assumptions? At least two assumptions you have to tell. And what is it? What is that? Which metric you consider? R square or adjust R square? In Python only R square. In R we get adjust R square. Wherever we have the adjust R square, we will consider. So that's how you have to tell. When then they will ask you, how do you choose variables using correlation? How do you identify multicollinearity using correlation analysis? Now there is another statistical method also for multicollinearity. We call it as WIF, variance, variance inflation factor. If WIF is greater than 2, then multicollinearity is there. But that is a statistical procedure. In R, we get WIF. But in Python, we don't get variance inflation factor. So there are methods and methodologies which statistics people use. The basic methodology we will implement in machine learning. Ultimate agenda is we need to get a model that helps in prediction. That prediction should be reliable and robust. Reliability of the prediction and robustness of the prediction. The two R's are very, very important. So if you don't give them, see, it's all 50-50. Not everybody buys all the suggested products on Amazon, right? But the algorithm suggests. Sometimes there are products which are not related to the product itself. So algorithm also makes mistake. Nothing is 100%. But what if out of 100 people, 10 people buy based on suggestion, that is also profit to Amazon, right? You may ask, so algorithm is suggesting, so 100 people should buy. No, it, there is nothing called 100%. Even if 10-20% people buy the suggested products on Amazon, which is based on an algorithm, company will make money, right? So there is nothing called 100% in statics that you always keep in mind. Will everybody watch whatever is suggested by Netflix? No, right? We just choose some or not, or you will ignore. Oh, okay, forget it. I don't want to look at it, the suggestions. That's all. That is how you have to make decisions. That is how the algorithms work. No matter how much algorithms work, there is always a human interface a human factor involved as of now. Maybe in future auto AI and auto ML will come and then it will be 100%, but now not in next 10 years. Not in next 10 years, you have that auto ML and auto AI. Uh, till then a human being has to be there to monitor and 
correct the models. So I'm stopping the share. They want to talk to you.